the common narrative European settlement America is one of tenacious and hardworking people conquering a bountiful but often hostile wilderness. Our white ancestors arrived for many reasons, and most were escaping difficulties of some sort in their homeland, hunger and economic hardship, the lack of inheritance for all but the firstborn sons, criminal sentences, religious persecution, and other oppressive conditions. And some were just seeking new wealth and fortune. And most Europeans shared a vision of opportunity in this rich and untouched land and knew that they had a Christian right and a mission as part of their experience. If you do come to the showing this Friday on the Doctrine of Discovery, you will see how policies rendered by 15th century popes grew into a religious charter for entitlement and a mandate to convert or dispossess native persons in all lands due to European Christians. But the myth I wish to dispel now is that this land is open wilderness. Before contact with the of 1492, although it's arguable, our best estimates suggest that the population of the Americas, North and South America, was almost as large as that of Europe, maybe 60 to 100 percent. This is not an empty. This included varied cultures with relatively stable and independent ways of coexisting. Sometimes peaceful, sometimes violent. European <laughs> explorers, though, introduced new diseases, and the indigenous, indigenous Americans had no resistance. Smallpox, measles, hepatitis, plague, and others. And this led to a demographic known as the Great Diet. Somewhere between 65 to 90 percent of all indigenous people in the Americas died from disease. And this was before the first English settlements we know of started to exist in colonies in Virginia and Massachusetts. So before Pocahontas and before the Pilgrims, a huge swath world's population died in the Americas, at least 50 million. And the ravaging of native persons by disease continued, continued to some extent for hundreds of years more. So the populations that our ancestors conquered contact when they settled this land were vastly smaller, weaker, and less organized than those that had preceded them. Our germs came before us, and they vacated much of the land and reduced the indigenous capacity for existence. This is important for us to know, and it's important fact for our Thanksgiving story. What we know about the first Thanksgiving is not much. I will read a brief account written by Edward Winslow, one of the group we call the Pilgrims, that is most of the primary source material about the celebration of 1621. And God be praised, we had a good increase. Our harvest being gotten in, our governor sent four men on foul way so that we might, after a special manner, rejoice together after we had gathered the fruit of our labor. They four in one day killed as much fowl as, with a little help beside, 
served the community almost a week. At which time, amongst other recreations, we exercised our arms. Many of the Indians coming amongst us, and among the rest, their greatest king, Massasoit, with some 90 men, whom for three days we entertained and feasted. And they went out and killed five deer, which they brought to the plantation and bestowed on our governor and upon the captain and others. And although it be not always so plentiful as it was at this time with us, yet by the goodness of God, we are so far from the want that we often wish you partake of our plenty. That way it works. <laughs> Indeed, there was a feast celebrating a successful harvest after this first successful year that the pilgrims spent on the colony. And both English and Wampanoag persons, including the chief, Massasoit, attended and contributed food and activities to this event. This much we know, except this fact. Let's run down the story that we have all heard in some form and probably acted out in our grade school days. The pilgrims arrived on the New England coast in November 1620, and they endured a terrible winter, mostly spent on their ship, during which one half of their small settlement perished and many more would have died without meat provided by local Wampanoag. Wampanoag natives. During the spring and summer of 1621, though, their fortunes in hunting and fishing provided much food, and they began producing food stores through gardening and agriculture. In this pursuit, they benefited from the assistance of several natives, particularly a man named Tisquanto, that we know as Squanto. As we learn, Squanto introduced the pilgrims to the local crops, especially corn, and the use of fish products as fertilizer. This was life-saving information, as the settlers had brought seed for a variety of wheat that would not grow in the harsh milling. Squanto proved important in diplomatic areas also, as he helped these settlers establish a working relationship with the local group of the Wampanoag tribe and with Chief Manassasoit. Some say good relations were forged by hospitality of the natives, and others that Massasoit saw being allied with these whites might serve as leverage in his ongoing conflict Narragansetts, because as the Wampanoag had suffered a huge decline in the previous perils of disease, the Narragansetts had been more tolerant, strong. But with Squanto as middleman, as peace was negotiated, peace was negotiated between the Wampanoag. So the autumn harvest was productive, and combined with the bountiful meat supplied by hunting and fishing, the pilgrims established a modicum of what we now would call food security. And they decided to hold a festival. They would not have called this festival Thanksgiving. They held events called Thanksgivings frequently. But these were strictly religious and dedicated to prayer and praise, and were often a fast. This was a feast of celebration. But to unravel this story a bit, we should first look at Tisquanto. The reason Squanto was invaluable to the pilgrims was because he was fluent in English and understood their ways. And if you know this whole story, you know it. I'll tell it anyway. 
how you might ask did the Native American on these wilderness shores come to know the white man so well and even speak his language? Well, the story starts some 15 years earlier, 1605, when an English explorer named John Weymouth visited the coast and befriended Squanto, who was a member of the Poconoke tribe. Squanto agreed to voyage to England with Weymouth, where he learned the language, religion, and much about English culture. He was brought back to his village by his close friend, and then in 1614, a less honorable group first engaged and then kidnapped Squanto and about two dozen other Wampanoag, took them to Spain, and sold them into slavery. Somehow, Squanto once again found his way to England, and it's thought that maybe he had the help of Catholic friars who did not approve of slavery. And then eventually returned once again across the Atlantic to his home. This was, took five years from when he was kidnapped. When he reached his village, he discovered that all of his people had died of an epidemic. Probably viral hepatitis. The New England tribes had engaged and traded with Europeans, mostly with British in this area, for about a hundred years before the Mayflower came. So the germs had been present. And the Poconoke, the village and the place we now call it, was vacant. To Squantum, now the Bowman Pocono took up residence with the local Wampanoa under Massa. And he was perfect. Okay. Two years later, a ship of white English settlers, the pilgrims, appeared at precisely the site of his old village. Imagine the surprise of pilgrims when they met this native who was Christian to As the pilgrims moved to occupy this Wampum's old village, they had to remove the bones and remains of many of the folk. In their minds, this was an act of providence that gave them a home in the wilderness. So what we know of the first Thanksgiving is a little askew. It did involve shared celebration, appreciation of native hospitality. But now that we know it also involved other aspects of colonialism. As many boats of pilgrims and other Puritans arrived on the New England, the situation of the native deteriorated. The English settlers believed they were God's elect and felt entitled to dominion of the land. Conflicts and wars ensued with gruesome results. The first time we know of the word Thanksgiving being used for festival and feast and not for a religious obligation was at least 15 years later, in 1637 when the Massachusetts Bay Colony declared a day of thanksgiving to celebrate the successful massacre of over 700 members of the Pequot Nation in what is now Rutland. So we learned that the first thanksgiving was based on images of joyful intermixing of cultures as pilgrim and native share in the glory and security of a good harvest. And in hindsight, it was clear that it also held importance to calamity for the native peoples of this land. And so we can see why 
Some Native Americans and others refer to Thanksgiving as a national day of mourning and hold protests and meetings each Thanksgiving across the United States, including atop Cold Hill in Plymouth, Massachusetts. If Thanksgiving is built on the Mayflower arrival scene, then it belongs with Columbus Day as stirring symbols. But there's another aspect of the story that renders it not so clear. Thanksgiving is an annual celebration or observation. It had been kicked around for a long time in colonial America. George Washington called for our first official celebration of Thanksgiving during the Revolutionary War and an annual harvest festival of this time was known thereafter. It became an official federal holiday in 1863 by proclamation of Abraham. So for over the over 200 years from the first Thanksgiving to Lincoln's establishment of the holiday, nobody associated Thanksgiving with the word natives, the Mayflower, or Sponsor. These were not historical events on anybody's radar. But somewhere in the middle of the 19th century, around the end of the Civil War, William Bradford's diaries of Plymouth Plantation were discovered in some archives And suddenly, during the 1880s and 1890s, Everything Pilgrim was trending, and it captured the public imagination. You know how fans work. And the story of the first Thanksgiving became a compelling origin story for a nation seeking to heal from the wounds of the Civil War. It drew attention to a time when we started and to a common national history and tradition. So many stories take a little history, a little myth, some wishful thinking, shake them all up, and would create a national in this case, about Thanksgiving. We exposed our children to this romanticized tale in school, and we tried to imbue this holiday with some special and unique And I find it interesting that the whole Pilgrim story was attached retroactively. It was not a necessary piece of the hobby, which was really already well established by the time we connected the nation. And because of this, I'm amazed that this history is so universal. Do we appreciate this story, or should we worry about the damage that followed simple solution? Should we be proud of the pilgrims for settling in a harsh and difficult land, or should we think about the arrogance, privilege, and entitlement that these chosen persons imported to a settled land? I hold this story of the first Thanksgiving with trepidation. It makes me uncomfortable. I do not hold a personal guilt about the continued displacement of the name of the population or about the many acts of genocide that were committed as Europeans elbowed their way across the continent. But I do feel real and immediate guilt because I'm thinking, allow and accept uncritical view that engage that part of our history. And a final aspect of Thanksgiving's story might be most important to me. It is more than I find it liberating in some ways that we can toss out the Mayflower story by realizing it's not good. Because I love all the other parts of it's good. Might be my favorite hobby. Although next month, this is probably. Although deeply Christian in its inception, it is truly secular in its current incarnation. Of above all, we celebrate family 
connection to others, and gratitude. Make butterball turn. In my eye, it engages everything that a religion or church might engage, but with no beliefs attached. In America, Christians, Jews, Muslims, non-believers, and even Unitarian Universalists belong at the Thanksgiving table. It's a time when we celebrate love and seek what is best in ourselves and one another. History, however recounted, must become story in order to be remembered. And story, true or not, can take the place of history if it is not challenged or held to the test. Both are matters of choices we make, things we choose to honor and attend to in some respect. When we choose to remember something, we imbue it with power. While at the same time we reflect its power over us. Memory is an expression of memory, history, story. These are all one thing. They frame how we see our world, how we understand our world, and how we know our place in this world. History is always written and created by persons. It can never be fully objective. Selectivity and bias always creeps in. But we must try to hold a standard of truth and integrity when reading history. And the uncomfortable truths are probably the most important to learn. In this time of revisionist history and the suppression of history, even in school, we must work harder to push truth as we know it. We sometimes refer to ourselves as a people of and hope. This is true aspiration, bringing meaning and purpose to life. May we hold memory to the highest standard that our hopes can be more. Amen. So be it and bless it. We will now sing hymn number 21 for the beauty of your. It's not brief. <laughs> 